Well, a big focus, the historic hush money trial of Donald Trump that got underway with the arduous process of selecting a jury to hear the case, charging the former U.S. president with falsifying business records in order to stifle stories about his sex life. Nine potential jurors in Donald Trump's hush money trial cleared an initial round of vetting as the first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president kicked off in a Manhattan courtroom. The day actually ended without any jurors being seated. The selection process was scheduled to resume on Tuesday. However, the judge warned Trump that he would go to jail if he meddles with the proceedings. He informed Trump that trial proceedings would continue even in his absence. In fact, we have a ground report from William Denslow. Listen in. First day of Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is underway. This is a trial that revolves around allegations that Donald Trump paid hush money to a porn star in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to the 34 criminal counts he faces. He says that this is a case of uh, essentially a weaponized justice system, all in an effort to hurt his chances of winning the presidency come November's election. Legal proceedings started here in Lower Manhattan with a few legal issues that needed to be ironed out. And one key issue went against Donald Trump and his legal team. They wanted to see Judge Juan Machan step aside. They are furious about the gag order placed on the former president, Donald Trump saying it is unconstitutional. But Judge Machan says he will not be recusing himself. In a win for prosecutors as well, Karen McDougall, who claims to have had an affair with Donald Trump, will be allowed to testify. But in a win for the Donald Trump and his legal team, an Access Hollywood tape in which Donald Trump could be heard saying he can grab women by the genitalia, that will not be allowed to be played in court. However, prosecutors can at least make reference to it. Jury selection is now underway in what is expected to be an incredibly fraught process to find 12 jurors deemed to not have strong opinions of the former president, either in favour or against him. For a quick sense of how difficult that will be, of the first 96 people called upon as potential jurors, over half of them put their hands up when asked the question if they had strong opinions of the former president, whether they could be impartial. Because more than half of them put their hands up, all those that did were automatically relegated from being possible jurors. Jury selection in of itself is a process expected to last up to two weeks. The trial in its entirety could last up to two months. Well, the former U.S. president is sticking with a strategy that amounts to attack and delay, it seems. Outside the court, though, Mr. Trump said the trial was nonsense and an assault on America, and I'm quoting him here. For a credible perspective from the ground, let's go across to the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce, Raymond Vickery, who joins us live on NDTV at the moment. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us on NDTV. He's also a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Sir, isn't the dismissals of dozens or jurors an indication of how challenging it could be to find a group of 12 impartial jurors for a case that's considered a high-profile sex scandal that also involves a former U.S. president running once again for the White House? Well, thank you very much for having me. Yes, uh, it does indicate the difficulty. This is a very important day for democracy. Uh, great democracies like the United States uh, and India pride themselves on the rule of law. Uh, and there are two basic principles here that are at stake and under strain. One is that no person is above the law. And the second is uh, that uh, the criminal law isn't used for political purposes. Now, what has happened, of course, is uh, that the former president uh, is uh, claiming that, uh, one, he's above the law, and two, that um, uh, this is being done for political purposes. And, of course, it's really not. It's a, uh, the district attorney uh, for Manhattan, which has nothing to do with the federal government, has nothing to do with uh, uh, the president at all. So it's going to be very difficult, uh, particularly since so many people, I mean, there's nobody in the United States that doesn't know about Donald Trump and very few that don't have uh, an opinion about him. 
So it's not surprising that if you get 100 uh, people as potential jurors, uh, half of them are going to say, well, I've already made up my mind about uh, Donald Trump. So this will take some time, probably the full, uh, full two weeks uh, to see the jury, and then we'll see uh, what happens. Right, Mr. Vickery, also another downstream effect of Trump's multiple indictments is that pollsters are now asking questions about Trump's legal troubles collectively rather than asking about each individual case. What is the ground reality? Well, I think the ground reality is uh, that, uh, has, which has been stated by Trump uh, when he was running the first time, and that, that is that uh, for his supporters, uh, he could uh, shoot someone on Fifth Avenue in New York and he wouldn't lose any uh, support. So that, um, that group of uh, Trump supporters is, uh, is, is, is a ground reality, and, it, and they're going to stay with him regardless. The ground reality beyond that is that the people who will decide the election this year are uh, very few uh, uncommitted, and uh, they will be influenced by what comes out uh, at, uh, at trial. Uh, at this point, uh, many of those people are not focused uh, on a particular trial. As you know, this is the first of four different um, trials which he can be subject to. And actually, uh, this one is uh, the one which uh, is uh, probably uh, the least important from a constitutional point of view. The others uh, have to do with interference of the election. Uh, and uh, the documents, uh, but uh, uh, people I don't think have uh, who are in this group of persuadables have not yet uh, focused on that, and they are. I think they will look at what happens, and if you can get twelve people, which is going to be very difficult to do, uh, it'll make a difference. Right. Some people are also debating whether Manhattan's District Attorney Alvin Bragg, a Democrat should have been brought on the case and whether it's strong enough. But there are very valid concerns at the same time that this is about an effort to defraud the American voters back in 2016 and also to keep them from learning material information that could or would have affected their vote. Well, there's no question uh, about it. Uh, of course, the fact that uh, the prosecutor is uh, a Democrat is, uh, is not really dispositive of anything. Uh, because it's completely uh, separate from what happens uh, with uh, the administration uh, for the full United States, the federal administration. Uh, and uh, you, it is customary to have an elected uh, prosecutor. Uh, and uh, in New York, uh, elections are usually won by Democrats. That doesn't mean that you can't do anything that has to do with a Republican. And uh, the real question here, of course, is uh, why did Trump uh, do this? Uh, and the prosecutor's view is, and I think it's pretty strong if you look at the Stormy Daniels uh, tape, uh, if you look at uh, what was happening at the time, uh, that Trump wanted to keep uh, this from the American public. Uh, so he could win the election. And you can't, uh, you can't do that, particularly with uh, corporate funds, which in, you say are uh, for legal fees, uh, when it's really going to uh, hush money to keep someone quiet so the American voters won't know the full story. Right. In fact, the ongoing war and the conflict in the Middle East has also clearly shaken up U.S. politics in different ways. We were reading that younger Americans and Arab Americans so oppose the White House's support for Israel that Joe Biden could even lose a state because of it in the election. But for some heads of state in the Middle East, perhaps a transition away from Joe Biden may mean less interference and criticism from Washington. But we're waiting to see what that will mean for foreign policy, for domestic politics. Let's see how this election plays out. But as always... Thank you so much, Mr. Raymond Vickery, for making time for us and joining us on NDTV. Well, sticking with the latest that's happening in the Middle East, Israel's war cabinet has met to discuss its response to Iran's unprecedented drone and missile attack. Israel did not make a, pub make a public comment, I beg your pardon, whether a decision had been reached. 
Its allies, though, have strongly condemned Iran's actions but urged Mr. Netanyahu's government to show restraint. Now, while Iran has signaled it considers the matter closed, the Israeli military chief of staff said the attack would not go unanswered. In fact, Israel's military chief has warned Iran that Iran could face the consequences for its actions following its weekend attack on Israel. We have some reactions coming in from Ground Zero. Listen in. When we look forward, we will be able to do our own work. And this is a lot of great work, 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 a lot of great work. Right. And in fact, the ambassador of Israel to India spoke to NDTV and said, and I quote, that they do not take or need to take responsibility for the Damascus attack, reiterating that Israel's government will decide the response to Iran's attack. Listen in. Thank you for joining NDTV, Ambassador. Uh, IRGC said uh, the attack was aimed at a specific target. Uh, what was their so-called specific target and uh, have they really achieved that? Uh, I don't know what their targets were. We know that they, they shot uh, 350 rockets, cruise uh, missiles, I'm sorry, cruise missiles and UAVs uh, carrying about 60 tons of explosives towards Israel. We uh, were able to intercept 99% of the incoming projectiles and uh, one a few, very few uh, missiles came in and hit uh, uh, army base, air force base in the southern part of Israel, but the base was okay uh, and continued functioning. Uh, unfortunately, there was one uh, girl, 70-year-old Muslim Bedouin from the Negev, from the south of Israel, who was severely wounded and we are praying for her speedy recovery. Iran has said that uh, it has completed its uh, counter-attack and uh, uh, operation is over now. But uh, if Israel attacks again, it will uh, retaliate in a big way. Following the attack, Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu vowed that uh, together we will win. So what uh, uh, he is uh, trying to say. So we have to see the perspective of time. What happened is for years Iran uh, is fighting Israel by proxy. It didn't start now. And this uh, firing directly from Iran to Israel is a further new es es escalation for the first time ever. It cannot remain unanswered. We were lucky to prevent huge effect and damage that they hoped to cause because they did it, uh, you know, they, they thought well the shooting at Israel because they shot three different tools and within their rockets even surface to surface different kinds and timed it to challenge together the Israeli defense systems. If the Iranians now think that they have a free card in engaging Israel every time or threatening Israel, we have to make clear to them that this is unacceptable and our abilities to retaliate are reasonable. You people are going to attack Iran in a big manner? I don't know. We will leave. Uh, I think it will be in a way proportional to the way we see the Iranian attack, but we will leave uh, how, when, uh, where uh, to the people who decide in Israel. The Iranians uh, can be waiting now and expecting our reaction. It will come when we see fit. U.S. is maintaining its position that it will keep uh, supporting Israel, but uh, at the same time it is also advising Israel not to go for any uh, offensive against Iran. Uh, U.S. has also said uh, it will not take a part in any counter-offensive against Iran. Uh, would Israel uh, follow U.S. advice or would uh, act on its own? What Biden says is the is, uh, U.S. will not par be part of a retaliation to Iran. Uh, we uh, respect the American partners, what they did now also with creating partnerships in order to help uh, prevent the shooting and their support to Israel is very valuable to us. The friendship of the U.S., I served twice in the U.S., is is incredibly important for us. At the same time, you know, at the end of the day, the responsibility for the well-being of the Israeli population is on Israel and its government, and the government will do whatever they find 
fit in order to protect the population. What uh, Iran has done, uh, it claims that it has done in retaliation of Israeli attack on its uh, consulate in Damascus, uh, uh, which killed uh, uh, IRGC former commander. Uh, Iran is also saying that Israel has uh, violated international law by attacking consulate, but uh, Israel has neither confirmed nor denied it uh, involvement in uh, Damascus attack uh, and uh, why it so. When we speak about harming uh, uh, Iran is a, is, a, is a leader, we don't have to take assume responsibility for anything. I mean, uh, ambiguity is sometimes good if it's us or not us, it's for others to decide, to think. But I would ask also why are uh, seven uh, Revolutionary Guards officers in, uh, in charge of making our region instable, uh, shipping weapons and training and, uh, and financing, terror organizations around the region are there in that place. That's a good question for people to ask themselves. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining NDTV. Thank you very much. Well, crucial to note that amidst rising tensions in the Middle East, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi is set to visit Pakistan on the 22nd of this month to meet with Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, President Asif Ali Zardari and the military leadership. Now, Ibrahim Raisi's expected visit will take place just days after Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel in retaliation to an alleged Israeli airstrike on its Damascus consulate in Syria that killed several people, including two senior commanders of Iran's elite Islamic Revolutionary Corps. The visit, official authorities claim, is part of an ongoing effort by Pakistan and Iran to improve their cooperation, which received a temporary setback earlier this year. Let's turn our attention now to Australia, where the police has now said that the knife attack during a service at an Assyrian church in Sydney was a terrorist attack motivated by suspected religious extremism. At least four people, including the bishop, were wounded in the attack in the western Sydney suburb of Wakeley. The assailant was a male teenager who was arrested at the scene and was held at the church for his own safety after an angry mob had gathered outside a huge crowd and demanded the attacker be brought out. We have some official reactions coming in from Sydney. Listen in. The young person has sustained injuries to his hand as a result of his actions. Uh, the prisoners did a fantastic job um, subduing him after he uh, stabbed the two clergy members. Uh, police are obviously making sure that that young person is safe and, and obviously with the reaction of the parishioners and obviously the local community, uh, there was concerns for his safety, hence the decision was made to detain him in, the, in our church until later in the night. Uh, last night, a 16-year-old uh, who has been uh, apprehended was accused of uh, stabbing a bishop uh, at Christ the Good Shepherd Church in Wakeley. Uh, this is a disturbing incident. There is no place for violence in our community. There is no place for violent extremism. We are a peace-loving nation. This is a time to unite, not divide as a community and as a country. Last night, the New South Wales Police uh, overnight declared this a terror incident and have stood up Strike Force Petrina. As a result of that declaration, a joint counter-terrorism task force has been established, which includes uh, the AFP and ASIO. And this morning, we have had a meeting of the National Security Committee uh, to receive formal briefings following informal briefings that occurred uh, earlier this morning. Well, you've just heard from the police as well as the Australian Prime Minister. For a quick comment on the matter, we have Jay Bhardwaj joining us live from Melbourne at the moment. Thank you so much, Mr Bhardwaj, for joining us on NDTV. It's the second stabbing in Sydney in three days. It's quite concerning. Religious extremism seems to be on the rise and the police is now saying it's a terrorist attack. That's true. Uh this is unfortunate incident which has happened uh, in Sydney last night. And now uh, it has come to un our understanding that 
police is treating it as a terrorist attack and uh, they have put significant uh, resources behind investigating uh, what transpired uh, to this young man to be radicalized and get his ex uh, in a Waverly church the way he has. Um, uh, as uh, we have given to understand from uh, security agencies that uh, a task force named Katrina has been established uh, um, late evening uh, yesterday, and they are uh, coordinating with ASIO and AFP um, so that uh, its link to overseas players could also be investigated. Uh, that's the purpose. Um, as uh, in the morning, uh, the short briefing told us that um, there is some connection of this uh, from Middle East as the target was a Syrian uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, it has very significant uh, in terms of when uh, the Middle Eastern communities sit where they do sit in Western Sydney. So. Uh, uh, another thing is that uh, the people who are victim right now, the church community, they are also urged by religious leaders and the politicians uh, as high as Premier of uh, New South Wales that please do not indulge in any tit for tat violence after this incident. Uh, otherwise, you will face full force of law. That is what uh, Premier said after several police officers were injured in a kind of right-like situation right. last night uh, in front of the church, where several, uh, almost 10 to 15 police vehicles were damaged and three police officers have to uh, be taken to the hospital. Right. Uh, they are saying that uh, if uh, police is indulged in uh, these kind of incidents, then investigation will be hampered. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhardwaj, as always, for joining us with the latest update on what's happening in Sydney. Well, let's turn our attention now to the China Watch, where the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, has called for fair competition in trade relations with China, while warning about dumping and overproduction as he spoke to students in Shanghai. We had covered his touchdown in China for three days. Mr. Scholz is visiting China against the back, uh, background of looming EU tariffs on Chinese-made electric vehicles and other trade-related tensions as well. The two countries are also split over how to handle Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The European Union, meanwhile, is mulling tariffs to protect its producers against cheaper Chinese electrical vehicle imports, which some fear will flood the European market. In fact, Olaf Scholz is set to meet the Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing before returning to Berlin. But why exactly is this visit significant? Well, many experts argue for good reason that Olaf Scholz needs China. With the next national election just over a year away, the leader of Europe's sputtering economy engine is running out of time to conjure a miracle and reverse his government's standing with the German population as it is now. Scholz's three-day visit to the Middle Kingdom, which began on Saturday, will be both his longest and most important foreign trip since he assumed office in late 2021. Meanwhile, ocean heat is driving the gl a global coral bleaching event, and it could be the worst on record. We bring you the details after this very short break. Hello, Moto. Motorola, India's best 5G smartphone brand.
आईपीएल का हल्ला बल्ला और सबसे शानदार कवरेज सिर्फ एन डी टीवी पर biggest carnival of democracy india's general election prime minister modi makes a formidable bid for a hat trick the opposition is trying to mount a united challenge and the southern parties are standing their ground as battle lines are drawn join us on an exciting journey on the road to 2024 Welcome back. Well, China's economy grew 5.3% in the first quarter compared to a year ago, faster than the 4.6% growth expected by economists. Data released just a few moments ago by China's National Bureau of Statistics showed that the GDP in the January to March period was higher compared to the 5.2% seen in the fourth quarter of 2023. Well, in other news, coral reefs around the world are turning white and dying. Scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration declared the world is currently experiencing its fourth global bleaching event on record. Now, this is bleak for pretty much everyone on the planet. Coral reefs operate like sea walls. They actually help minimize flooding during hurricanes. They provide homes to roughly a quarter of all marine species, including the fish people eat at one point or another. and they are an engine of the tourism economy in many places such as florida keys mexico as well as australia since early last year scientists have confirmed mass bleaching in the atlantic pacific and indian oceans including along the coastlines of florida the caribbean and the great barrier reef globally coral reefs have declined by half since the 1950s and this is largely due to climate change Indeed the leading scientific authority on climate change suggests that if the world warms by 1.5 degrees celsius relative to pre-industrial times coral reefs could decline by 70 to 90% and we're basically much to our dismay already there Well thank you for investing your time and in watching this episode of the World 24/7 on the NDTV network. We'll keep tracking the latest updates for you. Do stay tuned.